David, you have, you're basically my best friend. Like you, have, I have spent more time with you in the past couple of weeks, like outside of Giovanni, I have spent more, I think you are the person I've spent the most time with. So I'm so thankful that you are back uh, on the podcast, second timer on the podcast as well. Uh, my so pleasure. Welcome, welcome back. Thank you. It's my pleasure to be here. It's an honor. So we were just, uh, we were just chatting in the pre-chat and I wanted to actually include this as part of the podcast. I wanted to have you back on here because I want you to help both myself and my listeners understand how we can become more conscious um, and aware and, and more awake and aware of where we're making our decisions from. And I think what I was just about to say to you, and I was like, actually, let's just start recording, is there's something about this virus, about the reactions, about the polarity of the reactions that is so very triggering and so very unsettling. And I wanted you here to help us frame this in a way that is going, that is something healthier. You know, we were just talking about like the $2 trillion stimulus package and how that is really just preventing the economy from, you know, from going into a cardiac arrest. Right. Um, but I, I want you to help, help me and help everybody who's listening to this reframe this as an opportunity so that we, we don't go into, we don't have a mental cardiac arrest, that we don't get, uh, our reality doesn't shrink and that we can see some of the possibilities and possible expansions that can come from this scenario. Yeah. Well, you know, so I keep, I keep in the, in the, the calls that I'm doing um, for, for groups of people, I keep re reiterating that we have to think about this in the context of what it is and what it, it has an effect on. So life as we've known it has come to a complete standstill, basically for the entire world. And we're in a situation, we're in a crisis where the rules have changed. And not only have they changed, but they continue to change every day. So from a negative perspective, it's, it's getting it's getting more stringent, more and more states in the U. I think we're at 27 states now as of this morning that, that were under um, lockdown or, or couldn't leave your house type thing. Um, the economy is, I mean, the stock market is up and down. You know, it, it seems to be surviving so far, but millions of people are losing jobs. Um, business, millions of businesses can't operate. The, we've talked before about how so many people don't have a savings. So yeah. they're in trouble from they're in trouble from that perspective, um, but it, there's relief on the way from the government. So that so that is actually a good thing. But I think the thing that makes this this is one of those perfect storm situations. So you have the virus and you have how bad the virus is, and the deaths still aren't anywhere near things like the flu or you know other things that we've dealt with in the past. The fact that it 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 travels so rapidly and it's so serious when somebody does get it it's overloading the medical system so we have a medical situation we have a situation where people can't be around because they pass it too fast and it's affecting the economy so all of these major things that that are part of keeping us in a stable sane society are being overwhelmed to the breaking point um and we've never we've never experienced anything like where we had to stay in a house or not go to work or I mean, never in, in history, this is like, this will be one of the biggest things written about in history forever. And we're, and we're living through it. So the one of the good things that I think that people overlook is, can you imagine what this would be like if we didn't have internet? Oh my goodness. I cannot imagine. Like, thank God for the internet. Yeah. <laughs> God for the internet. Yes. I'm yeah. so grateful for the internet because you can, you can choose when you can shut it, like turn it on and, and turn it off, but I wouldn't be connected to you and have your brilliant mind being able to even just share this to the people that are going to listen to this. Uh, I wouldn't be able to extract the information that I wanted to get to be able to make better decisions for my family and for my business right now. Like, thank God this is not, this did not happen in the 1960s. Yeah, the, like the disaster that it would cause not to have the internet is unfathomable. I mean, mm -hmm. it would take so long for information to get to you. Like in the States, we only had three major news channels here. 
right, which they control how the information is distributed, you know, amongst the population. Yeah. And um, there would be no way. And, you know, the other thing is like, there was nothing like this grocery stores delivering food and Amazon where you could get basically anything that you want overnight or within a reasonable period of time. None of that stuff existed like when we were kids. So this is a major blessing that we actually have this. Plus it's, it's keeping a lot of people in business. Technology is allowing a lot of people to innovate and continue to move forward regardless of the fact that we're all kind of quarantined for a while. So I think that one of the biggest things is the, is the, the media itself is so contaminating the mindset of everybody with, because we're, because, well, in the States, we're in the middle of an election, right? right. This is a big election year from us. We're a divided country, uh, you know, between the Democrats and the Republicans. I don't think I've ever seen such a divide in the, like, I, you know, I will, I will say I am not the most politically savvy person. I sort of follow it. I'm a fringe, you know, popcorn watcher. Um, but I, even in, in the, I have a lot of friends, a lot of healthcare practitioners uh, in the States who I'm in regular contact with. And the dialogue is so extreme. If you're a Republican, and I have many friends who are Republicans, they have a certain narrative, they have a certain, certain touch points that I always hear from them. And the same is true on the other side. If you are a Democrat, there are certain narrative. And I love both, like I love all my people, right? But it's, right. it's really interesting. I have never seen such extreme views and mentors of mine who I don't agree necessarily politically with, you know, with, with whatever they're saying, but I love and respect them as people, but it's unbelievable how it, it is like, you know, when you talk about the law of polarity, like it's like the America is the law of polarity. Now you have completely opposite um, viewpoints. We have not seen this. So the last time it was this bad, Lincoln was president and we had the civil war. Mm -hmm. It has not been this bad since Lincoln. And if you, if, Stephanie, if you ever get a chance to go see the Lincoln Museum in Springfield, Illinois, it is one of the most educational things you'll ever experience because it's like taking, it's like looking at our society now, uh, back in, when Lincoln was president, when I forget the date that he was president, but going back over a hundred years, it's exactly the same. The rhetoric is the same the the name calling the language the the opinion you know, um, the opinions on both sides they have this hallway that you can walk down where they're actually presenting the argument in congress and they have actors reading from documentation of those arguments right and they were heated and they were nasty and like even the cartoons and stuff were horrible the, you know the political satire of the day was was rough it was really really rough yeah. um in a lot of cases it's worse than it is today so it's a it's a really interesting it's a really interesting thing to, to think that the outcome of that caused a civil war you know um and i think that in a lot of ways the virus is preventing that it it we have to come together on some level as a world, as human beings, in mm -hmm. order to overcome this. And we have to put down our disagreements and find commonality if we're gonna if we're gonna win and we're gonna we're actually gonna thrive through this thing. So what I'm telling people is only go to the news or the internet for facts and for information for the the, the proper decisions that you need to make for your own life. But to start off with a mindset of gratitude. And I know how hard it is for so, because I've talked to so many people in the last three weeks. It's unreal how yes. many people I've talked to. Mm -hmm. I know where their, their mind is. And, you know, when we see something in our environment that's negative, it causes us to go down a rabbit hole with thinking. It's just automatic, reactive, subconscious survival thinking. thinking, tremendous survival thinking. You've got flight, fight, or freeze. And in this situation, the only thing most people can do is freeze. Yeah. So that's not a good thing either because they can't take, they can't think proactively to make good conscious choices for themselves to get out of this. We don't have a literal way to respond to this that is similar to anything we've ever been through. So the, like the subconscious reactive programming is all about the unknown. It's the danger of the virus. It's the danger of the economy. It's the danger of the political situation. 
and we don't know how long it's going to last. We don't see any solutions coming um, that are that are hopeful as to when it's going to be over. So every day people are inundated with the unknown, and the unknown has severe consequences to it, the way that it's being portrayed, right? So I realize some of it is hyperbole, some of it is reality, um, and some of it is manipulative. But in any case, the way that the subconscious mind reacts to that is just shut down. Like people just shut down. Families are being torn apart because they're arguing. I've counseled several couples in the last few days that are just at each other's throats and they had really great relationships before this started, but they're projecting on each other their own fear. They don't know how to deal with it. So what I'm suggesting is that we start with the known, uh, our, the, our, ourselves, our family, and, and make a list of what we're really grateful for in life. Because we have to reframe this, I think, from the inside out. You know, because if we do that, it gives us a sense of control back. Where, because that's really what's going on for a lot of people is they, have, they don't have any sense of control, which doesn't give them a sense of certainty in their life. So the idea is how do we get back a sense of certainty so we can make sound decisions, we feel confident in what we're doing, we're knowledgeable about what's actually happening. And to control, and to, sorry to interrupt you, David, but to also to control what we can, because that's yes. what you just said there, I think, has hit the nail on the, on the head, squarely on the head. That's the, it's the lack of control or lack of perceived control and the lack of clarity about how to move forward. And people are frozen to, you know, when you said fight, flight, or freeze, people are frozen in terms of their thought. They can't see the, the, uh, alternative solutions or new possibilities for them. They're just frozen in sort of the, uh, you know, the original way of thinking, which is what I think the subconscious mind is trying to, is trying to uh, maintain. Yeah. Yeah. Ab yeah, absolutely. Um, so what it needs, what our, what our mind needs is it needs us to kind of step in with some emotional maturity as adults and start giving it some direction because it doesn't know what to do. And part of the direction is to, is to focus on what we're grateful for, because it brings us back into the reality of the things that we do know first, right? So everybody has their personal life. You have you as an individual, and then it spreads out into your family, your friends, maybe your business, whatever, whatever your, your personal circle is, and really start making a list of the things that you are grateful for. Because it takes us out of the unknown and it brings us down to something that we know and something that we have somewhat control over in the moment. That kind of calms the nervous system down from that aspect. Um, I like it better than meditation. And the reason I like it better med than meditation is because in a lot of ways, and I don't want this to mis be misinterpreted, a lot of ways meditation has us disconnect from the reality that we're actually experiencing, which is good for a while, but we still have to come back to dealing with it, right? So it's great to calm yourself, to center yourself, all of that, but it's not giving the mind something to focus on that's real, and that's very important right now. So gratitude does that. Then as we expand it out into the world, we can start looking for things that are in the unknown that we can be grateful for, like the internet, right? We can be grateful for the internet and we can actually think about, huh, from a cause and effect perspective, how bad would this actually be if we did not have the technology that we have? The technology that we have is probably also what's going to save us because it's going to allow us to find a fix to this virus faster than if we didn't have the technology and the, and the world's experts working on it. So that's something to be grateful for. The individual relief, whatever, I know that this is, you probably have a lot of people from a lot of different countries listening. Um, it's different for every country. So you have to look at and, be, and educate yourself on what your country is actually doing to help you as an individual. So for instance, my CEO and, 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 and friend, you know, uh, Steph Tuss, yeah. she, when the bill was passed, when Trump signed the bill, she spent that whole night, she was up all night, she didn't sleep going through the whole 800 page bill, finding everything that in there that we could take advantage of to use to help us continue to move forward as a company and not lay people off and, and do all of those kinds of things. And there's a tremendous amount there. Like there's a lot, but you have to be willing to do the work because nobody's going to sit down and say, oh, here's what you can do for you. It's like, here's the information. You have to go through it and figure out how to use it yourself. So people have to have a little bit of personal agency 
and take responsibility and say, okay, I'm not going to get into self-pity. I need to figure out a way to help myself, help myself get through this. Um, and yes, it's good to have conversations with friends and family and, and experts and, and all of that stuff, but you still have to educate yourself and make decisions for yourself. You have to stay informed during this and stay out of uh, the negative. It's, it's extremely important. I believe, I thoroughly believe that based on the seven laws of the universe, that nobody is in a position where they can't turn this around for themselves. However, it starts with responsibility, personal responsibility for their own situation. It starts with changing their, what their mind is actually, <clears throat> excuse me, actually focused on. And then actually thinking about their individual situation based on priorities. What needs to happen first, second, third, fourth, fifth, and then being willing to educate themselves, take the time to educate themselves in order to make the proper decisions. It's not ignoring it, running away from it. It may be that they have to get on the phone and they have to talk with their creditors, see what they offer, tell them that they need you know, um, you know, to you know, put it on hold for a while, uh, whatever. What, you know, people are willing to work with everybody right now. So if you run from it, you end up in trouble. If you actually hit, deal with it head on, make the phone calls, talk to people, communicate, people come out all right. And then from a business perspective, it is opening up business possibilities like I've never seen. You know, things like Uber were started in a recession, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So this opens up tremendous opportunity for people that, that are looking at their business that want to retool. I was talking with a woman uh, yesterday, a matter of fact, who, who creates these, and she did this in her neighborhood. There are these, uh, I, I don't want to say statues, but they're like these... Um, things that she does with balloons where they're, they're tied to like a stake or something and they're all decorative and you could put them in your yard. And on the top of them, she put this all throughout her neighborhood. It said like gratitude, hope, joy, peace, love. And all the neighbors got together and they started putting these things all over the neighborhood. And I said, you know, why? She said, well, my, my business is uh, events. I do events. And this is one of the way that we decorate events based on what people want. So we retooled her whole business, whole business so she could break all of that stuff down and sell it in packages so people could do their own neighborhoods, mm -hmm. including with air pumps for the balloons and, and everything. And they're going to fly off the shelf for her as soon as they're done because people are looking for anything that they can get involved with in order to create some positivity in their own life. So there's a lot of different things that people need to be looking at as far as what ability do I have and how could I innovate in my own life to, to look to help, help somebody else. Because if we just look at self-preservation, the whole world shrinks in around us. But if we look at how we can help or bless somebody else's life, that opens the door for both of us. That's where the abundance happens for both of us. And I think for, you know, potentially a really long time, I think we've only been thinking about ourselves, you know, that love thy neighbor, you know, that principle of looking after community and being involved in community. I think that those have been uh, dwindling uh, in 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 past years, and I've had many guests on the podcast who've talked about the importance of community and rekindling that idea. Whether it's from a health perspective, we spoke to uh, James Muscal, who his book was literally called "The Community Cure," and talking about why people in the blue zones who have very limited access to advanced medicine, but what they do have is very ritualized sacred community rhythms and rituals. So I love this idea of thinking about not only, well, just not thinking about just yourself, but thinking about how you can be in service to others. Because I think that it serves two things. One, it starts to nurture that community aspect that you were talking about, but it also gets you out of your own way. Like whenever I'm feeling, if I'm starting to get anxious or I'm starting to get down or depressed, the single best way for me, and we can talk about some other strategies here, but one of the things I've discovered is if I can be in, in service to someone else, I immediately improve my mood. And this was very true for me when I was in private practice. Uh, if I was, you know, there was something happening in my personal life or, you know, whatever it was, and I would go in and be in service to my patients by, even just by lunchtime, I was flying. I was, I was, experiencing joy and I was feeling like I was contributing and I felt meaning and purpose. So I, I love 
I love what you're saying. And, and you, you mentioned something I just wanted to circle back to and sure. maybe have you define a little bit because I thought it was so, so juicy that I wanted to just uh, extrapolate a little bit more. This idea of personal responsibility. And you and I have had offline discussions around what that means, around it being your ability to respond. So I wanted to have you maybe talk, speak a little bit more to that, especially for somebody who's listening and they've been hearing you say, well, the gratitude is the first thing that you can do to sort of have a mental task for you to focus on something to expand your awareness or, you know, this, uh, the, uh, this idea of being personally responsible or having the, the self agency to respond to this situation. What can you say to someone who is trying to practice gratitude, who's just not able to have that personal responsibility or that ability to respond. Are, are they supposed to fake it to the, like, are they supposed to just kind of pretend like they're grateful and then they're gonna see things expanding? Can you, is it like this fake it till you make it kind of thing? Well, it, yeah, yes and no. So, so let me just start from the beginning with responsibility. The, the idea about responsibility is that you're not, you're not saying that, that you did this, right? That's not what it is. It's taking responsibility for your own life and the situation that you're experiencing in life. Because if you don't, if you just stay in blame, then logically the only way to get out of it is for everybody else to change what has gone wrong so that you feel better. So it, it never works. Blame never, it never works. So the idea is that you forget about who caused this, what caused this, whether you think they're handling it right or not. And you bring, you bring the responsibility very close to home. So you own it and you, you, because that gives you the power then to control your own life. Like I've said, a lot of things have been a, that uh, a lot of opportunities, a lot of the ways the world work, those choices have been taken away from us. This is very much like you were telling me about your friend that was like, this is like a communist country now. It very yeah, much yeah. is like a communist country, very much. Yeah. I used that analogy right from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. So a lot of choices have been taken away from us, but our ability to choose has not been taken away from us. So that means that we have to just understand that we're under a new set of rules that has a new set of obstacles, but it has also a new set of opportunities. And if we're willing to look at the way life is right now and not the way that it was, the re by taking responsibility, we can then begin to see the opportunities uh, in our own life. So when a, person, when a person can't get into gratitude, they have to ask themselves, why are they stuck in blame? What is it they're actually resisting? Because here's what blame does psychologically. It gives a person a feeling of control but it's false control because there's nothing that they can do with it, right? So I can be angry and I can be bitter and I can be hurt and I can direct that at whatever entity I want for causing this, but it does nothing for me, right? I will die blaming somebody else for the situation that I ended up in. And again, it's not about saying that something or someone didn't cause this. Like, I'm sure all of that will, will come out in the wash at some point as to everything that could have been done, should have been done, wasn't done, whatever. But blaming doesn't do anything for anybody. So Is, it, is that a trauma response, do you think? I, I do think it's, in, in many cases, it's trauma response. Okay. In many cases, especially for somebody who has not done any work on healing a trauma response. You have to remember, the worst experience during trauma is the feeling of being out of control. It's somebody having control over you or a situation having control over you. So mm -hmm. blame gives us a feeling of control. Um, but it's false because there's nothing we can do with it other than stay in, the, in, the, in that situation of blame. So if a person understands that, what they, what they can start to realize is that they're actually hurting themselves by blaming. It's, it's, there's no way out of that. They have to change the way they're viewing what's going on so that they can accept responsibility and begin to uh, take back their power. When you blame, you give your power to the virus, you give their power to the government, you give your power to everything else but you. So responsibility takes your power back, which then gives you the ability to engage your power to choose and make better choices for the situation that we're in right now.
Yeah. And if you, so sometimes it can be as simple as when we're thinking about getting back into gratitude and taking, you know, taking you control over the things that you are able to take control over in this moment, just as simple as, you know what, I woke up today, you know, it's a day above ground. Like that can be this, where we start. And you've, you've talked about this idea of as you are practicing gratitude, and you've said this a couple of times already that your uh, it, that your universe begins to expand and then you can start to, when we're using that, and maybe you can uh, just have a quick review of the law of cause and effect, but there's something that's causing this, but we can also change and maybe I'm using the law wrong. So correct me here, but we can also change the effect that it's having totally. by practicing that gratitude because as you expand your awareness as you expand your universe there will be new solutions or new opportunities that you may not have considered um present themselves to correct absolutely there always is because that's the the so you there's two laws that affect this uh, very deeply the law of cause and effect and the law of polarity the law of polarity states that every single thing in the universe has an opposite that means if there's no opportunity, there's opportunity. It, it, you can't have one side without the other. So the, the thing that allows you to see the other side is how you use your mind to work around on the other side. If I don't see any opportunity, it's probably because I'm in blame. That causes me to only see the problem. It causes me to see what's causing the no opportunity. So then I look at the government. I look at how I'm stuck in the house. I'm looking at how I don't have a job or I'm losing my clients and my business. And I stay on that side of the law. If I go to gratitude, if I go to responsibility, I start to look at what's good about this. And when I start to look at what's good about this, I can start to see the opportunity. It opens the door to the opportunities. I can start to see who I can help because it creates a contrast between what's wrong with this and what's right with it. And when I can get the contrast in my mind because I've moved from one side of it to the other, or when I move from one side of it to the other, I can get the contrast in my mind and it allows me to then see where you may not see uh, a solution for yourself, but I could see it mm. because you're, you might be stuck in fear, but I'm not stuck in fear. So you're focused on what's wrong. And I could say, Hey, here's some opportunities for you to turn this situation around, whatever problems you might be having. And that can happen for everybody, absolutely everybody. We all have the ability to do it. I think one of the most undervalued, underused, undertaught uh, concepts is just how powerful our, our ability to choose is. You know, we make choices every day, but nobody ever really taught us as a child how powerful that choice is. We either create or destroy our life by consciously using choice or unconsciously using it, mm -hmm. right? So if we can become aware of that, wake up to it, we can, we can start to see the value in practicing gratitude, in taking responsibility, in understanding that we have the power to do something about our own life. We might not be able to fix the world right now, but we can fix our world. And is that about becoming more, you said, becoming more awake or becoming more conscious? So we are making these decisions from our conscious mind versus our subconscious mind. Could you take a moment just to describe those two? And then I, I have a, I have a sort of a follow on question that's coming to me around. I've, I've heard you talk a lot about this and we talked about this in the last, last podcast. So for anyone who's listening, please, I think it's episode 17, uh, go back and listen to David and, and mine, our, our conversation on the conscious and the subconscious. But for so many of us, the subconscious is the fear, it's the survival. But my, my secondary question is, can we also hack in, can we also get into the subconscious for good? Can we also have positive, can we get in there and not just be always in that survival state? Can we actually hack it for, and be acting from our subconscious from a place of positivity? Yes, absolutely. Because, um, what exists there also is what I call our spiritual DNA, right? If a person's not comfortable with that word, use universal DNA. It's the DNA that gives us our individual purpose in our lifetime. So all life has an individual specific purpose. And the way that purpose works is that in all life has to benefit some other life in order to exist. 
okay? The, the benefit that human beings get for benefiting other lives is satisfaction. Mm. It's fulfillment. When we're doing what we were born to do, what we're put here to do, we have an unbelievably fulfilled heart, an unbelievable amount of satisfaction and gratitude in our life. When we're doing what other people told us to do or raised us to do that's not in our heart, we're usually bitter, disgruntled, not happy, lost in life, like it, it gets crazy. So the idea is, can we tap into the original desire that would have that would lead us into our purpose? Now let me let me just can I do a little teaching around this? Is, oh is my that goodness, okay? please. Okay. Yes, can please. I bring my whiteboard in? I would I love it, that. I think it would help. All right. Hang yeah, on. and we're doing this on so we have this on audio, but we're also recording this video. So I'll also make sure that this video is available as well. Okay. Yeah. All right. Let me just adjust this here. Can you see so the whiteboard excited. okay? Yeah, I can see it great. Yeah. Okay. So, all right, I'll try to do this quick, but just to give everybody a, a visual on, on how this works. So if we take our head and we look at it like a fishbowl, this part right here would be known as the subconscious mind. So when we're born, we don't have a conscious mind develop. It doesn't start developing till around seven. And then I think it goes to like uh, 20 for women and 22 or 23 for guys. I forget the actual number, but it takes, it takes a long time for it to actually uh, fully develop. The subconscious mind doesn't have the ability to choose. It, it has to accept anything that's put into it. It can't tell the difference between reality and what's imagined. Um, it doesn't have the ability uh, to choose, and it has to manifest within through your body whatever it is that it's programmed with. Has to. It will always express it. So it'll either that's like if you hear somebody say, "I don't express my feelings very well. I suppress them." You you do express them. You just express them in an unhealthy way. That's where like passive aggressive behavior comes in, vindictive behavior. All the negative uh, dysfunctional behaviors are actually emotions that are being suppressed and then they're coming out in a dysfunctional way. So everything that's going on and around us when we're kids gets programmed into our subconscious mind and that becomes the foundation of how we think, right? Now, by the time we're seven, we start to develop, it kind of looks like an egg, uh, we start to develop a conscious mind where our ability to think and our ability to choose comes from. We have senses. We see, hear, smell, taste, and touch. All of our outside information is coming. So we have our results. We have our circumstances. We have our environment. Our environment's made up of people, places, and things. We're constantly observing this environment. As we observe it, it, the information is being fed back into our conscious mind, and it forms an image of what we see. Automatic reaction from our subconscious mind, what we've been programmed with, tells us how to think about what we're experiencing. And we do that through pattern recognition. So our whole life from little kids, everything is done repetitive, patterns, constant spaced repetition. Mom feeds us the same way, same time. We go to bed the same way, same time. We brush our teeth. You know, we change our clothes. We take a shower. Everything is, is rhythmic and it's in specific patterns. So we learn through pattern recognition how to react and respond to what we're experiencing out here. This is not thinking. This is reaction. So 99% of our life is reaction. Like we can change the reaction by we learn more information and we integrate it. But if we don't have a pre-programmed reaction to something like this virus and this whole new situation, the mind does something very interesting. It goes into comparison. It says, what is this like? What knowledge do I have that resembles this that will allow me to make a decision to be safe. So it actually does one step before it goes into fight, flight, or freeze. And that is comparison. If it has nothing to compare it to that's viable for this situation, it goes to the amygdala. The amygdala goes fight, flight, or freeze. And then we take the action based on pure survival at that moment. And that's the problem that we're facing. Nobody has the pattern recognition to deal with what's actually going on. Yeah. Right? Mm. 
we, we, we may not like it, but we have pattern recognition on how to deal with death. We have pattern recognition how to deal with divorce, cancer, illnesses, all, you know, fires, car accidents, all different kinds of tragedies, war, because we see it all of our life. But we ain't never seen anything like this. So that's why so many people are going into freeze and they're hyper-focused on the only thing that they control, which is the negativity. So as long as they can blame and they can focus on that, it gives them a, a, a feeling of certainty in their body, but it's not a healthy certainty because it, there's no action involved other than freezing. There's nothing that they can do, mm. except they talk with their friends and they're constantly texting or you know, posting stuff. So people are desperate right now to do something positive. Like we're also seeing really great things. Like people are coming together in community. You know, we're coming together. Our communities are coming together. I'm doing this with many other people in, in, the, in the hopes that we do something positive to help a lot of people, which is a really great thing. So now what we want to do is understand that when we were born, we did have what I call a spiritual DNA. And it's interesting. The early Greeks said this is where the heart was, not the heart, not the beating heart in your chest, but the heart of life mm. existed here. So I tell people the way that we recognize that is through desire in its Latin root, which means desire, which is of the father, not desire in the way that the church made it wrong, like base desires like sex or money or, you know, how they kind of twisted those things over the year to try over the years to try to make them wrong, where they said all desires are not good. That's not true. Desire actually gives us direction. So in human beings, it's desire in animals and plants, it's instinct. So all, all animals are born very comfortable in their environment. If they have any parental guidance, it's only until they can take care of themselves, but they instinctually know how to build a nest, dig a hole, dig a, dig a tunnel, kill another animal, do whatever animals do to survive. Um, and, the, and it all interacts with each other, like, you know, the bees with flowers, they're, you know, the, the, the flower is beautiful and it smells to attract a bee, mm -hmm. not for another flower because it can't march over and mate with another flower. It needs a bee to be able to, to do that. But human you beings. Say, have, can I interrupt you for one moment? Yeah. When you say of the father, is that is that the spiritual father or is that yes. your paternal father? No, spiritual father. Spiritual father. Okay. Spiritual father. Yeah. yeah. So it's it's based in it, it's based in I think the Orthodox or the early Christian idea. Yeah. It's also based in Hermetic philosophy, which what all religions actually start to come from. So the, yeah, the father, the father being like, like the universal, the the universal mom. father, you could say the universal mother, it doesn't matter to me, yes. okay. I don't get stuck in the semantics of it. But, sure. but that's what it is. And that direction comes from this. Now, the problem that we have is that unless you had very aware parents, your parents didn't teach you to follow this. They taught you how to be safe. And basically, it's, here's all the skill sets and knowledge that you need to know to go from birth to death and hopefully not make too many mistakes and live a, an, an okay life. And we're indoctrinated in that right from, right from birth. So, I mean, shortly after we're born, we start going to school and then everything is regimented from there. And school mimics uh, corporations, right? So we're, we're, getting, we're, we're being prepared to, to join the workforce and to join the consumer force in the world. And everything is set up around that. How do we go on vacations? All the marketing and everything for that. How do we uh, retire and insurance? You know, like everything is set up for us to actually be safe. But actually, we weren't designed that way because safety doesn't exist. So I've been telling people for 20 years, there is no such thing as safety. It's an illusion based on the way that you think about it. Because at any moment, something could change to take everything away from you. And I think that this... Like, like this. Like this, this is a perfect example. It's an absolutely perfect example. I used to use the example like you have people that worked all their life. They traded their time for money and then uh, the market crashed or the bank misappropriated the money or somebody embezzled it and their whole life savings is completely gone overnight. I had a good friend commit suicide in 2009 
because half of his savings was wiped out overnight during the, the crisis that we had here, the financial crisis that we had here. And he was made fun of by his wife because she said he was so stupid that he left his money in the, in the markets and he lost half of it overnight. You want to hear the craziest thing? He went from being worth $100 million to $50 million. I mean, it's not like this guy was on food stamps even, right? But he, was, he felt so ashamed because he self-identified with that success that he killed himself. He killed himself the day after Thanksgiving in 2009. I'm the so problem is this. We, we're never taught to follow this desire. So we're taught to follow the programming, which you could say beliefs, paradigms, pattern recognition, whatever. And it, it depends now on which one we're going to actually listen to. Because both of these are trying to communicate to our conscious mind. When we're, when we're kids, we have no problem fantasizing about things. We'll take sticks and rocks and pots and pans and all different kinds of stuff, and we'll play for hours and keep ourselves busy. But once we had to start to conform to the way the world works, fantasizing or daydreaming became childish. And it was like you were, you were discouraged from, from going there. Unfortunately, it's through fascination, it's through, it's through dreaming, it's through self-expression that we actually learn who we really are. That's how we find out who our authentic self is. So if we can allow ourselves to go back to that, it's always speaking to us. And it shows up in desire. It says you have a feeling that you want to be, do, or have things, yet you tell yourself, I can't do that now. I don't have the time. I have a family. That's irresponsible. That's too much money. I, you know, People will judge me. And we lock ourselves in one box after another box after another box because we're following the programming that people gave us about how we're supposed to be in life versus how we naturally would have shown up in life. Had somebody said, hey, what is this kid interested in? Just naturally, let's help foster that. And if it's not the thing that they want to do, let's find out what else it is and, and really let the child begin to experience who they are so that by the time they're an adult, they really have a self-awareness about, about who they are, and they, and they actually accept themselves. So now we have this situation going on. We see this situation constantly out here, this, uh, this circumstance that we're, that we're dealing with. It's going in, and it's forming an image in our mind. The meaning that we give this image, this information, is everything. Because we emotionally experience things based on the meaning that we give them. So if we look at this situation and we say, this is bad, this sucks, life is over, this is all Trump's fault, it's the Chinese's fault, whatever we're doing that's negative, we will experience the corresponding emotions with blame and hurt and pain and victimization and, and all of that. So in order to change the emotional experience, we have to change the meaning that we're giving to the outside observation of what's going on and also how it's affecting our personal life. That's why I say if we can go to gratitude and we can actually start saying this is good, we give a command in our mind to look for externally what's good out here, but also we begin to open up this heart here that begins to open up and come to the surface because we're not following the pre-programmed uh, pattern that we were before. So we're giving ourselves a conscious command. It opens up the heart and the heart then starts telling us what to do. And that's where you see people now helping. They're trying to be part of the solution and not part of the problem. It's causing them to look at different things. They ask themselves, what do I really want here? Do I want to come out on the side of history where, because, you know, it, when this is all over, there's going to be a history book that tallies up all the deaths, all the people that lost everything in their life. Uh, and that's probably what most of it will, will tell you, all the victims of this. Do you want to be one of those numbers or do you want to be one of the numbers that survived, that was a thriver, that actually came out on the other side of this better than when you went in? And if we follow this desire based on the idea that we give what we're experiencing a new definition, a new meaning, a productive one, we give a command to our mind to find what's good in it because that it has to exist. We also find the opportunities. We change our experience. So when we take action on it, we get a different result. 
that different result is now fodder for the desire because we're seeing the result, which contradicts the fear. If I can take control of my life and get a new result, like if I'm a business owner, if I can still make sales during this, I'm contradicting the fear that I can't make sales, right? right? But I have to think outside of the box possibly to do it. So if I think that this is going to break up my family and I actually take time to sit and talk with my family and we set productive goals for ourselves as a family, I beat, I beat the fear. I give myself a new result on the outside of myself. I see it. I experience it both with my, with my senses and with my internal body. And then again, that opens up the desire that feeds the desire of what it is that we really want. The underlying idea for that desire for everybody is more life. Because everything that we contribute, which is all part of our purpose, is designed for more life. Life begets life, which is the continuum of, of the universe. It's constantly in an expansion mode. There is no such thing as evil or uh, an evil power in and of itself, because those two things could not exist in the same space. The, the universe, as we know, it would infarcate on itself. They would cancel each other out, and everything would cease to exist. So what we see as death or bad or wrong or evil is the improper use of the law, right? But the law is more life. And then you have good or bad on the polar opposites of that law. The law is abundance and we have wealth or poverty within that law. So those are the opposite sides of the truth that we have. So it's not that it exists in and of itself. They're connected. And, and through the power of our own choice, we determine what side of that experience we're going to actually live on and manifest in our life. And it, can you also make the argument then that because the virus is not more life, you know, it is not a proponent, it's, it's actually dis destroying life, that it cannot be here for it cannot exist indefinitely. I, and I, I bring this up because I want, I have, I have, I don't know how I want, I'm going to say, use the word faith, even though I'm not necessarily a religious person, but I have faith in the idea that this cannot last forever. Right. And I'm trying to extra, like extrapolating from what you just said, my interpretation and tell me if I'm off here is that because the virus is, has been so destructive or maybe, maybe, yeah, I think that's what I'm trying to say. The virus has been so disruptive that it cannot continue to propagate indefinitely. So here's the thing. We have to understand something. The virus follows the same law of more life as everything else does. So what it's doing is the only energy out there is the energy that causes something to grow. That's why you have things like cancer. But there's no consciousness to it. It's just an abnormal growth uh, however it was caused, and it continues to follow that until something destroys it. So like cancer, is, is, it, it still has not figured out how to uh, really kind of propagate because it kills its host. Right? It's either killed or it kills its host, right? Mm -hmm. The virus, as we talked about before, will you, as you educated me to, it will weaken over time because if it kills its host too fast, it cannot, it cannot continue to it's pass. It's its host to continue to replicate. Yeah, yeah it, exactly. So, so here's the thing. Everything in the universe operates also, and, and a lot of people really don't like this, but there really is a law of the fittest, right? So the thing that is, that is the most fit for more life will always win. That's why we will beat the virus, right? Right. Because whatever produces the most life in the universe wins. That's why the weak are, in all of nature are called out. That's why the mating rituals are they are the way they are, so that the best genes come together, so that you have stronger animals and plants, and everything begin to to move forward. All of that selection is based on the idea of more life. It's very very intelligent. It's very intelligent. It's it's interesting. Uh, I've had conversations with people offline who are um, of the opinion that this is a Darwinian correction, like the I, this idea of natural selection, um, which is why I think work. You know, the work that I, you know, the work that you do in terms of mental resilience and mental health, the work that I do around helping people reduce some of their comorbidities, like the obesity and the inflammation and stuff, these things are going to become so important for people to either, it's like sink or swim. Um, 
because we're seeing people with some of these higher comorbidities succumb easier. Uh, of course, there's outliers with everything, but we're seeing people with these comorbidities, the inflammation, the type 2 diabetes, the hypertension, the, you know, the, the list goes on, uh, succumb to this at a greater fatality rate or mortality rate right. than, uh, than those who don't. Well, you know, I've talked about this for years and, it, and I, it's never popular when I talk about it. And I'm sure it won't be popular here either. But you have to really look at it as a truth. If you look at our world uh, as an organism, what it's constantly doing is self-correcting when things get out of balance. We are pushing 8 billion people on this planet. If we can't sustain that, nature is going to try to bring it back into a, harmoni a, har a, a, a harmonic balance mm -hmm. with itself. So you're going to see things like this happen because the world is out of balance, right? And we're not doing anything with the 8 billion people to bring it into more balance for the 8 billion people that are living here. You know, we have 25,000 people that starve to death every day right. on, this, on this planet. So we have to look at it from the perspective of, you know, the one thing we've never beat is nature. Right. Right? We're not, I don't think we're ever going to outthink nature. It's just too complex and, and it's more intelligent than we actually understand. So it's no surprise to me that something like this would happen because if we get out of balance, if anything in, the, in, in nature gets out of balance, it does something to correct that balance. That's what causes storms and that's what causes hurricanes and that's what causes floods and wind and fire and everything. It's constantly keeping everything in a balance so that life in general can continue to move forward. If it gets out of balance, it's wiped out and then it starts over again. It starts anew, yeah. Coming back to what you were just saying with the spiritual or universal DNA and desire, I love what you're saying here because I think that a lot of us, as you were saying, we're programmed to move away from our desires or what we our natural talents might be because of the institutionalization during school or you know the you know workplace training or, or what have you. And the one thing that I have been trying to lean into now more so than ever is listening to my desires. Like, what is it that I really want to come, whether it's just coming out of this in this post coronavirus world, but in general, what is it that I actually want for my life? And I like this idea of trying to hack into this spiritual DNA or this universal DNA so I can allow my innate inborn of the father desires to start to uh, prickle up. Do you have any frameworks for how to begin to, um, I mean, it sounds like you're talking about creating a, or maybe creating a desire list or the things that you would like to see. I often talk about them in, you know, different silos, like fin what do you want to see in your financial life? What do you want to see in your health and fitness? What would you like to see in your career, in your spiritual life, if that's important to you, your intellectual life, if that's important to you, your social life, all these different silos in which we operate or that are important to us. Yeah. Are, do you have any frameworks for us? So gratitude I'm hearing is one of them, right? So reframing the meaning. So it's not that we are ascribing a good or a bad to anything. Uh, and, or when we ascribe the meaning as negative or punitive, that's when we can get into that uh, pre-programmed response. But when we ascribe a positive meaning through the vector of gratitude, this is when we can get into our desires. Are there other ways that we can tap into those desires to have those bubble up into the conscious mind? I think for most people, I tell people, desires are showing up in your secret thoughts, the thoughts that you have that you don't tell anybody about. Hmm. Um, things, things that you fantasize about, things that you say, you know, that would be cool. You're interested in that. But for whatever reason, you don't act on it. We always have the perfect reason not to, right? So we don't need to go into what the reasons are. But you don't, you don't act on it. If you start to acknowledge what those things are, we have to remember that for most people, when it comes to their purpose, they're pretty far off course. So the universe has to bring you back on course. So it's going to show up in what you want to be, do, or have. This is, this is where it gets really interesting. So let's say that you have a desire and you want to buy a really cool car, like a Maserati or 
Ferrari, Jaguar, Jaguar, Jaguar. Yeah, whatever. That's but it doesn't. But it's. But it seems like the most impractical thing for where you are right now. Right? You may say to yourself, "I can't afford it. It would be irresponsible. I really should be putting money in my business." Uh, we've got goals that we have to set. The family wants to take a trip, you know, to Africa next year. Like you, all these reasons why not to do it. You have to ask yourself, what is the reason that you have the desire for that? And I'm not talking about a fleeting idea like, oh, that would be cool, but you never think about it again. Like you're really attracted to something. You're having that attraction for a reason. Your, your soul is trying to tell you, hey, wake up. This is going to lead you to, because really what the problem is, is low self-worth, right? Not understanding ourselves lowers the self-esteem to the equivalent of whoever raised us. So it's trying to build your self-worth up to see what you're capable of actually doing in your life. So you're really attracted to things based on the ultimate idea of who you can be as a person. It doesn't matter what it is. What matters is that you take action on it because one thing is, once you open that door, other things start showing up. If you don't open the door, then nothing shows up. So you have to open the door, whatever it is, that's what you take action on and then it'll open another door and it'll open another door. And before you know it, you're stepping into your life's purpose and it can come with something that seems as silly as like a car or moving or a house or a person or a, like anything. Um, I saw, I, I had, uh, I, I may have had told you this before. I was at a Dan Kennedy conference. He's a very famous direct marketer many years ago. And he, we were, he was, pre he's, the guy's a genius. He was presenting ethical arguments uh, around sales and marketing and stuff. And he said, okay, I'm going to present this argument. A salesman, his job is to sell. It's not to determine who he sells to. It's to sell. So you got a guy who's selling cable television or, or, or satellite television. He goes to a trailer park, obviously very run down, very, very uh, poverty ridden trailer park. And a guy comes to the door, looks like he's got habit problems. You know, just the last thing he needs is to buy satellite television. Is it unethical to sell this guy the, the satellite television when he probably can't pay for hardly anything else in his life? So most of the people in the room raised their hand, yes. And he said, okay, so let me paint a scenario. What if you sold the guy the satellite television and he's watching the TV and he secretly wants to get out of where he is, but he doesn't know how. And he sees a, an infomercial for, say, like Tony Robbins or one of, the other, one of the other things that help people improve. He takes that course and it totally changes his life. Was it unethical to make that sale? So the universe is always trying to get the truth to us, but we often put a mask over what that is because we judge it as something else. And I have found that I've been teaching people that for 21 years. I did it in my life. I was floored by how fast my life changed when I started following what I really wanted. And now I never not follow what I want. And sometimes it seems crazy as hell but it always opens the door to something else like every single time. Um, so I think that, the, I think it's that it, you know, what would it be? We could think about this logically a lot of different ways, but how would it be that you're, that you're attracted to do your purpose? You would have a desire to do something different. You're drawn to something like, when you're attracted to a human being or when you're falling in love, you're drawn to that person for, for a reason, right? Um, you're drawn to, you know, maybe you're drawn to skiing or you're drawn to boating or you're, you're drawn to race car driving or you're drawn to botany or, or chemistry. Like we're drawn to things for a reason. And if we follow that pull, that inner pull in our heart, it never leads us in the wrong direction. It's when we get in our head and think, oh, I can't do that, or I need to do something else, or it's not the right time. That's when we have trouble. And for a lot of people, when, that's, when they really start to wake up to this is after they've gotten married, they've had a few kids, uh, they realize life is not showing up the way that they thought it was, and they start to really desire something different. But now 
they have a whole shit ton of responsibility in front of them. And they think, oh, it's irresponsible for me to do anything different at this time. But usually it's somewhere between 35 and 45 that a person starts waking up to who they really are. And, and they realize time's not getting longer, it's running short. So if I'm going to do something with my life, I need to make changes now. So that's, that's my thought around it. What I have found to be very useful is I've started journaling. So I'm trying to really get to my desires and I'll just be like totally open and transparent here. I'm also, I'm also taking a course on sensuality and the first thing, so we had our first uh, course, like first, you know, training today. The first thing that the teacher said was make a desire list. And it doesn't matter how crazy it is. You know, it could be a $10 million, you know, home and the, you know, 16th arrondissement in Paris or, in, you know, the most beautiful place in New York or whatever it is in the Hamptons. But there's a reason why you want it. So I love that you're saying this because she literally had said this earlier today in our online class. And I think that when we think about desire, it is the, it's the intersection between who you are and this universal DNA or the, the, the powers that are greater than you, the universe uh, you know, to use your language, Joe Dispenza has called this reaching into the quantum. Yep. Uh, there's been a lot of, like, it's, it's all kind of talking about the same thing. Like you would never have the desires if they weren't meant for you. That's right. You know, like I have never thought of being, I'm trying to think of something like a, a physicist. I've, I've never, you know, I've read about physicists. I've studied physics. It's yeah. not for me, you know, but someone who thinks about math problems or that, you know, or whatever it is, if you have a certain desire, and even if it's as uh, extraneous and deemed, you know, inappropriate as, you know, some $20 million home or the car or whatever, there's a reason why you're, I love that you're saying that because that's, uh, I think for, for women, uh, for men and women, truly, uh, when, we're, when we're talking about this in, in the context of sensuality, that's also another way to channel your, um, uh, uh, your power. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And you're also it, the, the feeling of it in our body is a vibrational match to it. Yeah. So it, in a lot of ways that thing, so w w your, your purpose in life is a frequency, right? It is, it's literally a frequency that's inside of you, but it's kind of like a, a radio that somebody pushed the mute button on periodically. Right. Yeah. So when we feel it, it caused, that's why you may want something different than me. Like you may see that car and be like, fuck, that car's hot. Or, and I don't like that one. And I like this one, but you don't like that one. Mm -hmm. So we're all different in the sense of what it is that we're drawn to. But, but the woman that was telling you that she's a hundred percent, I totally agree with her. You have to move towards the desire because it's all trying to get you on purpose with your life. You don't ever see any form of life sitting around going, what the hell? What am I supposed to do? Like, you don't see a confused squirrel, you know? <laughs> yeah. They start off and they know how to be a squirrel, even though they're, yeah. Off, you know, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I love that. Can you, can you walk me through, just because I would love for you to give me some practical, tangible applications of this. How are you right now structuring your day so that you are putting yourself in momentum? So that you are, is there a cadence or is there a... Um, uh, a rhythm or rituals that you practice that, that you have found to be very helpful. I have, and I'll, I'll preframe this by saying I have been falling back on my rituals and rhythms. Like they have become even more important for me. And I'm usually very strict about them. They're, they're very sacred to me, but in this time, it has almost become my full-time job to look after my physical health and my mental health so that I can still be in service to others. Cause I have, as you do, people who listen to you, people who look up to you. And if you go down, you know, then they, you know, then they go down. So there's, right. a, there's a sense of personal responsibility that I have for my tribe, for my people. And I have been like, like, a, like a ninja with my, with my physical and my mental uh, rhythms and rituals. But I would be cur I'm curious to know what are some of the things that have been working for you or that maybe you've adopted or that you've, you've doubled down on since this crisis has started? Well, one of the things that I'm very grateful for was that a lot of what I'm teaching, I've integrated into, in, it's automatically how I think now. So it's not difficult for me to find what to be grateful for. I just automatically think that way uh, now. I'm not, 
I have never been one that is uh, panicky or nervous or anything during a crisis. I actually have a weird calm that comes over me. And I think that's because my childhood was so chaotic. And I've noticed other people that have had chaotic childhoods feel a weird sense of calm during something like this because it's almost like a normalcy to their brain, you know? Right. Yeah. Um, but I, I'm, I really try to pay attention to how much sleep that I'm getting. Uh, I'm working basically seven days a week right now along with, along with Steph, but it's my choice. And I'm trying to make sure that I'm getting the proper amount of rest. I'm, I'm eating well. Um, I am, uh, I'm compartmentalizing my day based on what has to be done. So we have the business and the, and the issues with the business that we have to deal with. And then we have content creation because I'm doing so many new things. And then the application of that on top of coaching. So I'm, I'm adhering to a very strict schedule and I'm not allowing things to be thrown in there that, that aren't necessary. So I've been uh, uh, kind of militant about it, so to speak, mm -hmm. l lately. That's why when I had the internet go down on me uh, yesterday, that really threw a wrench in the, in the whole thing because it was a yeah. big scramble to get that taken care of. But mostly health and, and eating well and, uh, and, and it's, I'm, doing, I'm doing some mild exercise like walking and stuff like that. So That's good. And I, I also just want to say that for anyone who's listening, you don't have to do exactly what David is doing. You know, you don't have, I've been very uh, open and transparent around the things that really work well for me and what time of day they work. You don't have to do that. But the, I, I ask you because it's nice to to understand what you have found works for you. And it's an invitation for anybody who's listening to say, okay, I think I'll try that on. Like, let me try on that, that t-shirt and see if that fits. And if it does, great, run with it. It's yours. Right. And if not, then, you know, you take it off and you try the next size, or you take the, you know, the next brand or, or what have you. I also have, I also have kind of like a mantra that goes through me all the time where it's, I look at everything and say, this is good. So that I'm always looking for the good in it. Even if I, even if I intellectually know that there's consequences in it that I don't like, I'm looking for why is this good? Because I'll tell you this, this much I do know. Everything that's ever come into my life that has been a challenge or a downturn or an, a not pleasant experience while it's happening, I've been unbelievably grateful for when it's over because it's opened the door to something so much better uh, in my life. So I'm, I'm pretty used to knowing that it's always going to be that way because that basically follows the law of rhythm. It's also the law of polarity. Um, so I, and, it, and it's kind of like for, you know, either you can either say the universe is good all the time or God is good all the time, whatever works for whoever's listening to this, because that is also in harmony with the idea of more life. This, there is a much bigger reason that we're experiencing what we're experiencing. And we probably won't know that till we get on the other side of it. Cause that's the way it works. The yeah. consciousness that got us in this is not the consciousness that will get us out, nor the awareness we'll have when it's over. So we'll be able to look at this at hindsight and we go, Oh, okay, look at where we are now. And if we hadn't gone through this, what direction were we actually really headed in? Right? So, cause I think that there's going to be really, really great things that, that come out of this when it's over. Well, there's even, and I don't have the numbers, I'll, I'll look this up and make sure that I put them in the show notes, but the pollution from the factories that were closed down in China, they're already, they were set, there were, I remember viewing some satellite images over, I think it was Wuhan, China, you know, pre-coronavirus and then post, you know, when they had to shut down all the factories. Right. And there was some estimate, and I'll, I'll fact check myself in the show notes here afterwards, but because of the clearing of pollution, there was an estimate around 60,000 people per year were not going to die of pollution related deaths because the air in and around these, where these factories were closed is, has now cleared up. Right. So it, it just reinforces what you're talking about around the law of polarity. And I might have my numbers wrong a little bit there, but it's, it's, a, it's an enormous number of people who die every year in China because of, you know, this, you know, the yes, pollution, the coal factories there. and all that kind of stuff. So I'll make sure to have the stat in the show notes, but to just to, 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 to and you know, there's going to be a huge baby boom in nine months, right? Oh, <laughs> yes, absolutely. There's going to be Corona and more life, right? So there's going to be more babies, uh, you know, nine months from now. Absolutely. And 
I, I just love everything you're saying. And I wanted to just plug your podcast for a moment because you did an incredible four series. I think it was a Zoom call, but you had translated yeah. them into podcasts. So tell, your, and yours is one of the four podcasts that I listen to. Um, and I tell everybody about it. So I love it. So plug it and tell people uh, where they can go to find that. Four, you did a four part series on navigating the crisis. Right. So it's, it's called, uh, so it's, my podcast is called the Successful Mind Podcast. And it's on all the different podcast channels. The, the four-part series I did in response to uh, this crisis actually going on, uh, and it's, it's uh, basically, what the, what the hell is it? It's how to, hang on. I think it's how to navigate a crisis. It's how to navigate, I can, why, why can't I remember this? I've been, because I've been doing spots all day. Yeah, that's uh, okay. How to navigate uncertainty during a major oh, that's crisis. Right. That's right. That's right. Yes. How to navigate uncertainty during a major. So it's four parts. And now if you, if you go there and you listen to it, the other thing is that I'm every Monday for eight weeks, I'm doing another live uh, bonus to that. So it's kind of like um, uh, an upkeep that we're doing for eight weeks. So if you listen to the four, I did, I did the first one last Monday. I did one today. And then there'll be another one Monday and then there'll be five after that. So, and it's going to probably continue on as long as this is going on. So it's just to support people, give them tools and techniques to be able to use, help them think about different ways to think about it. And our, my team is working uh, like tremendously to provide more resources. So there's a, we offer a link with a landing page where you can find all the resources that, uh, that are available currently right now. So as many as we can find, we're sharing them with everybody. All right, I'll get that information from Steph and I'll make sure that that's in the show notes okay. as well. Because I would love, and I, are you doing, I, rem I remember, list, so those weekly, that's going to be out on your podcast or that's out in a Facebook group? It will end up in the podcast, but we're doing it live. So the people that registered for the call, they get an email on it and then they can listen to it live. But then after that, it goes into the podcast rotation. Okay, perfect. So, um, and can I get that link for my people as well if they want? Yeah, sure. Just ask Steph. She'll, okay. she'll give you all of it. Wonderful. Well, I, I wanted to thank you for your time. I know we were supposed to talk yesterday and like the internet went haywire. So I appreciate your rescheduling on such short notice. And I also just wanted to thank you because your mental flossing, literally, like the way that we floss our teeth, this has been like mental flossing for me in terms of reframing like, I, you know, I've oscillated too. There's been days where I'm like, Jesus Christ, the world is coming to an end. Yeah. Uh, and, I've, and I've felt a lot of, and I think being an empath too, you can just sense the energetic disarray. And I've been speaking to so many of my people in my community and they're depressed and they've lost their jobs. And I just hear, you know, the, the, the saddest stories. And um, I want to thank you because you've helped me stay, you know, to drive, to drive the fortitude and the purpose that I have for my people to show up and serve for them. Yeah. Uh, your techniques have been just instrumental. So I wanted to thank you publicly. Uh, and of course I will, I'll text you that privately as well, you know, but um, thank you very much. You're very welcome. My pleasure. Thanks for having me on. It's great to be your friend. Hey, 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 hey.